Mm. We've all journeyed to a deep land. <laughs> and I have literally done that in this last week. I was in the Trinity Alps. Brenly and I were backpacking for four days. And at the trailhead, it says, there's a sign that says, you're about to enter a special place. And it really felt like stepping into another realm, a place where there's no sound of traffic, only the sounds of rushing waters, the sounds of occasional birds, or the crackling of the fire. And the beauty that filled my eyes, well, it's hard to describe it. <laughs> I mean, the, the yeah, <laughs> the green rushing river and the stark white rocks with the sunlight playing through the bright green, summer green kind of leaves that are glistening and creating that dappled sunshine. And the ultimate destination where we were, Emerald Lake, that opens up into this great vista, a green lake surrounded by craggy peaks. I mean, it's, it's heavenly, <laughs> our world, you know? It's, it's like entering heaven. What I imagine heaven to be is here, truly. We say it all the time, heaven is here, but it is here in California. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are we blessed or what? It is an amazing, magical place. And so to see better at night, I also wore this a lot. And while very dorky looking, it also is extremely practical because it frees up your hands, of course, you know. And so when I would wear this at certain times, because, you know, after a couple of days, you just fall into that yummy place of just, it's just now. You know, I watched my dog be in the now presence. We would encourage him when we come across the creek, drink now, chaos, have some water. You know, he's not thinking about how far down the trail he has to go. He doesn't want any water right now, so he doesn't drink, you know. It's just all about now. If we stop, he rests. If we get up, he walks, you know. <laughs> and so I would wear this at night and, you know, to put out the fire, let's say. But as I was wearing it to do this mundane task, to see the ash and make sure everything was out, it would be like seeing back into the sacred. You know, the memories would come back from the, when that fire was alive and dancing just an hour ago. When I saw the snake turn into the lizard, turn into the dragon and the magical dancing people in the fire, you know, how fire is. And now, just as ash, as I was putting it out, I would see those sacred visions again. Or when I would go into the foliage, you know, over here, like in the forest, and try to find this. Anybody know what this is? A bear bin, a bear canister, that's right. It took me like five days to learn how to open it, so I'm pretty sure a bear can't get in it. <laughs> I'd be like to Brenly, show me again how this works. <laughs> But in it, this is where you store your food and your toiletries because, you know, of course, if a bear is attracted to it, it might play with it. It might roll it down the hill. You don't want to put it too close to the cliff. Um, but it can't get in it, so your stuff remains safe. And so it you generally is stored a couple hundred yards away from where you're camping. So, you know, I'd say, oh, I want to go brush my teeth, you know, so I'd have to go find the bear bin and use my light. But then when I did, you know, when I would get a hold of the bear bin... It wasn't just the mundane process of going through the toiletries, but what I would image then is the bear we saw that evening in the dusk, walking like a California Republic t-shirt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's for real out there, you know, right at the edge of the meadow and the trees, there's the silhouette. And I don't know if the bear saw us, but it was just, doo -doom, doo -doom, just doing its thing, you know, and there we are in complete awe. And so it is with this light that happens to be sitting on what we know as the third eye, right? The, or we could call it the first eye, really. The spiritual eye. The eye that's, that illumines, as Jesus said, the lamp unto the body. He said, let your eye be single and let the body be full of light. 
He was talking about the spiritual eye, illuminating this third eye, the spiritual eye, igniting and activating the power of imagination so we could vision and we could see as God sees the truth of what this world is all about. We could see with that kind of beauty. So when we go up, there's a Japanese saying, an ancient saying about going up to the mountaintop. And when I come down, I carry the mountaintop under my skirts into the marketplace. And so when we have these experiences of utter beauty, like hard to describe beauty that exists, that is real, can be touched and felt and, and heard and seen. And when we carry those images with us, we carry the truth of what the world is meant to be, this heaven on earth, and we make it so. Then we can carry, once we've had these experiences, whether they're literal or just in the mind's eye, we can bring that into the most horrific places, the most traumatized, war-torn areas, and we can see that illuminated truth. I remember um, I went to Germany before the wall fell, and to East Germany, and, um, and so we went through check, Checkpoint Charlie and into Eastern Germany. And it went from West Germany, Berlin, lights, you know, lots of activity. It was Christmas time. There was just, you know, music and lights and all this festive, festive kind of experience to this black and white world. I mean, it was literally like I walked from a color movie into a black and white movie. But then, oddly enough, every so often there would be like a super bright blue car or a pair of fuchsia shoes, but everything else was black and white. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like that experience where in those places where there is sadness or trauma or difficulty, we carry with us the vision of spirit to see as God sees, to bring that lamp that is the body full of light. Let your eye be single. That's the way that the Christ sees as a single eye. And we are that. We are that light-filled being that can see in this way. So the power of imagination is the sixth of our 12 powers. And it's, as I've mentioned, located here in the body at the third eye or the first eye, the spiritual eye, the single eye, whatever you want to call that. And it is here that we begin to, you know, we can do some meditation work and begin to really focus in that area of the body like we can do with all the powers and begin to kind of open things up, begin to bring light in and out. And so just play with that a little bit, that the light begins to flood beyond the boundaries of what we once thought was the physical body and begins to kind of morph and merge with everything around us that is light. That is the truth, to be able to see, to really see as God sees, sees the truth in everyone, sees the love and the joy and the peace, even when you're not feeling it, and calls it forth. And within ourselves, when we, we are seen in the mirror, we can see that truth of who we are with the power of imagination. We can vision and dream the kind of life we want to live and the kind of world we want to experience with this power. This is a fun power. It's the creative power. It's the, it's the power of art and music. And imagine a world without imagination. <laughs> Can you do that? Imagine a world without imagination? <laughs> how flat it would be, you know? How it would be this sort of black and white experience of just sort of, you know, flatness and, and words. No imagery, no innovation, no art, no symbolism. None of that sort of ooh, how cool thing that we do when we experience phenomena in our spiritual journey and we share with one another. And, you know, all that is that creativity, that symbolism of the soul, that beauty and art and that, that opens up. And without it, ugh, would we want to, like, experience this at all? It sure wouldn't be have the juice and the passion and the, and the creativity that I think so many of us are buoyed by and animated by. So the, uh, the disciple for this power and, uh, is Bartholomew, who was Nathaniel when he was called. Nobody really knows why his name was changed. They think Bartholomew might have been his surname that he went by later. But anyway, Nathaniel, when he was called as a disciple, was sitting under a fig tree, and Jesus had never met him. So when Philip went to get him and bring him back, he said to Jesus, well, how did you know to call me? You never even met me. 
And Jesus said, oh, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. And so what he was indicating is, I saw you with my mind's eye. I saw you ahead of time, and, and I asked that you be called. And so it's that power of ability to image in advance. It's the power of being able to see whatever it is that we dream about already fulfilled and to feel into that. That's the visioning power, to feel what it feels like when we are in full abundance, to feel like what it feels like when there is an ease around our financial freedom, to feel what it feels like when our body feels vital and alive and healthy and lean and graceful. To, to imagine that, to feel that, and to be in that vision is to make it come so. It's the co-creative power of spirit. This power of imagination is something that, that brings forth all the good in our lives in all ways that we wish to bring it forth. And where things are not going so well, where there is challenge, we can revision. We can recreate our lives. We can go back and, and restore what it is that we really want to experience. We could even relive our childhood in our mind's eye. And we can recreate scenes that, don't, that, that play through our head that maybe were difficult or hurtful or traumatic. And we can recreate what it is that we want to live. Where is it in our realm that we want to live? It's all thought, it's all make-believe. It's something that we get to choose again and again and again. And through the power of imagination, we get to do that. It's signified by the color sky blue. So it has that kind of expansive imaginative feel to it. And also the prophetess, Anna the prophetess, who was Mother Mary's mother, and was quite a visionary herself. So, so there's all these significant um, or symbols of, of what the power, each of these powers means if you're just joining us. Each one has a color, a disciple, um, a female character from the Bible, and a location in the body. And then each one is activated into the fullness of who we are. And so this power of imagination, as we dream, as we vision, as we image, we, we really open it up as we work with light, as we work with light blue, sky color. So when we exercise the power of imagination, we awaken to all the possibilities that are available to us and just sort of download whatever it is that we wish or upload, if you want, into the world. And Einstein, the scientist, actually talked about how imagination was more important than knowledge. That's what made him such a genius, right? He said that imagination encircles the world and it's the preview of life's coming attractions. It allows us to see in advance what it is that we are creating. And so as Linda Martellet Witsit, one of the 12 Powers authors says, there is a process of conceiving the divine idea or from within, conceiving the divine idea, sort of a receiving the seed, the idea of what it is that we are or what it is that we're imagining for our life or what it is we're imagining for our relationship or our work or our service or our health or our prosperity, whatever it is, we can, we can conceive that idea and then we vision it, then we feel into it, we see it in our mind's eye, we use that single eye to really see it, to feel ourselves, as Abraham Hicks would say, to be in the vortex. Right? So it's a, we're in the vortex. We feel what it feels like to be in the vision. We, we see what it looks like for us to be moving in that vision for our, our lives or our community. We can imagine our community. We can see this, our, our place you know, doubled in size. And we can see lots of a joy and connection and healing and transformation happening right here. We can see our patio filled with people after service who want to know one another, who want to form friendships and want to serve in new ways and want to learn at deeper levels and want to be together in, in, in growing in our spiritual practices who have found companionship and home here. I can hear myself just getting really excited, so, okay. <laughs> so we take a nice breath, yeah. <laughs> but the possibilities are endless, and when we activate the power of imagination, it's like we turn the light on, and we say, oh, yeah. It's not just this that I'm seeing with these eyes, this same old, same old things that I see every day, but it's when I see from this place, I see the divinity in you. When I see from this place, I see the possibility in us. 
And when we see from that place, it is, it's, it's that excitement and that power of possibility that like opens up everything. Light on the inside and the out, beauty on the inside and the out. And then those amazing places that we go to, either physically or travel to in our minds. I mean, we can be armchair travelers and just travel in our minds, right? We can go to those places where there are rushing rivers and no sounds of traffic in our own minds, in our own easy chairs. <laughs> and we can go to that place where we see our friend who is feeling sick, whole and well and restored completely. And we can go to that place in our mind where maybe our bank account doesn't show when we look with our physical eyes the amount that we feel like we need or want or desire, but we can go in our, with our single eye and let our single eye see the abundance and the truth and the lavishness that is available to us. We can instantly manifest whatever it is that we need when we see with the single eye the lamp of the body, the body full of light. That's the power of imagination. And you know, we all have it in us. We know how to do this. As children, we played. We did imaginary play. You know, we see other children and you might think, well, I don't remember doing that or it's been such a long time. But you can find yourself again in that space as you maybe interact with children or remember with your mind's eye some of the imaginative play that you used to do. Or anybody have an imaginary friend? Oh, yeah, a few of you. Yeah. I had an imaginary friend. Her name was Phoebe. She was a mouse child, sort of a cross between a mouse and a child. She was about this big. And, uh, and I, my si next sister, old, oldest sister, was five years older, and so she was off at school. So I imagine what I was doing was creating a playmate. And Phoebe, I mean, she was so real. We would play board games. It seems like I always won, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I would lay out the board and she'd take her move and, you know, I would take my move. And, and so there was this wonderful experience. But, you know, it became more than just my playmate. She then became a part of the family and a part of my everyday life. And so we'd all be sitting around the living room. My mom would go to sit down in her chair in the evening. I'd say, Mom, no, don't sit there. She'd be like, what? Phoebe's sitting there. She'd be like, oh, okay. You know? Bless her heart, she'd go sit somewhere else, you know, and I'll honor Phoebe. One day my mom was driving down the road and I was in the car. We come to the stoplight and I look over and I say, oh, why, there's Phoebe's mother. <laughs> you know, we can create anything. So whatever it is that you desire, become like a child again, you know, to enter that kingdom of heaven and imagine whatever it is that you need or desire. And then it becomes real, it becomes so. It becomes manifested. This is the magic of the work of our 12 powers, and particularly this power, imagination. So these, these three things, the conceiving of the idea, the allowing of the divine idea of what it is that we desire, and then the visioning, the feeling into it, the seeing it, the imagining ourselves, and, and beginning to really see ourselves and feel ourselves in that space, and then embodying it, living into it, you know, really allowing ourselves to, to be in that vision, whatever it is that we hold. We can vision with our families, we can vision with our communities, we can vision in partnerships of all kinds. And oh, the places we'll go and the things we'll do when we align with that place instead of just this idea of what we think is physical reality. So whatever it is that we might want to recreate, things that we want to revision, um, we can just set it right by seeing it right, Winifred Hausman, Wil Wilkinson Hausman said, another 12 Powers author. To set it right, see it right. So you just see it the way you want to see it. <laughs> and then you begin to, as you see it, you begin to believe it, right? As you see it from here. So there, a great transformation occurred with a man named Saul. Some of you may know Saul, who became Paul. Saul on the road to Damascus. Saul was, was vehemently opposed to the teachings of Jesus. You know, he didn't, he just, he, Jesus was a charlatan to him. And so he, but he was a very gifted speaker. And so he went everywhere. He was very charismatic. And he convinced people through messages of what he was against 
he, he was very forceful and dynamic at, at what was not, you know, not okay. So it was like that, that we can either be for what we are for and move into the vision of the possibility, the peace, the love, the joy that we want, or we can push up against and resist and, and put all of our energy into the negativity of what we're against. And Paul, Saul at the time was like that. Saul's name, um, original name, meant personal will. So it was more about the ego. He was more in that space of ego. And so he's walking one day on the road to Damascus, and along comes this vision of complete light, a light body that, it, that he recognized as the body of Jesus Christ. But it was just this brilliant light, much like that, that light-filled body of the transfiguration. And he comes to him and he says, uh, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why do you persecute me? And, and Saul falls to his knees and he's blinded literally by the light. The Christ light is so bright that he is blinded by it. And his physical eyes go dark for three days. He can't see a thing. And then in a vision, another healer, Ananias, is, is encouraged to come and, and heal Paul. And so he does put his hands on Paul's eyes and they, or Saul, I'm sorry, he's still Saul there at that point. And the, and the like scales, they say, fell off of his eyes and he could see once more. But now he's seeing with the third eye, the spiritual eye, the single eye. He's seeing from the Christ light, that light that blinded him has healed him, transformed him. And now he's using his gift of preaching to preach about love and harmony and possibility and this divine being that is the truth of who we are, your hope of glory, Christ in you, he talked about. At one point he said, we all with unveiled face begin to see in the mirror the glory of the Lord and we are transformed into the full image of spirit. So by, we begin to see the truth of who we are and we're transformed as he was transformed. Any of us can have at any time this kind of 180 turn. Saul turned to Paul. Saul, that name that was personal will and ego, became Paul, which means little or humble. He became humbled in the grandeur of who he is and, and was and who we all are and became the messenger of that new message. And so this is likened to, in our modern world, something like the Dalai Lama being welcomed back into Tibet with his whole Buddhist community, you know, with love and welcome and the teachings again. I mean, that could be that kind of 180 that could happen, a turn like this, a transformation like that. Or it could be that the, the fractures or separations that you experience in your family are completely reunited and healed in ways that you couldn't have imagined just today or yesterday. But now it's there. Or ways that your body may feel weak or, or broken in some way or in pain some way, and then all of a sudden the transformation, the recognition, the power of imagination and the truth of who you are dawns on you and suddenly you see the truth of who you are and you begin to feel it and live it and know it. Anything can be turned around just like that through the power of imagination if we work the power if we allow ourselves to open to all that it is. You know, John Lennon had the great song, the iconic song, Imagine. And I would be remiss to not mention, imagine in the power of imagination. And he imagined things like a place with no countries. Imagine no countries, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. None of these lines, these demarcations, these compartmentalizations that say us and them, us and them. You cross this line, you're this imaginary you know, human-made line, and your family must be separated, and there must be angst, and there must be... But imagine, imagine a world where there were no borders, where we were just one world and one humanity and one family. Imagine what that would be like. Imagine that there were no possessions, he says. I wonder if you can. <laughs> if there were no possessions, 
So that, what would that mean? It would be like we weren't in this place of I've got and you haven't, or I don't and you have, the have and have nots constant dance of lack and abundance, lack and abundance. We would shed the whole thing, the whole idea of limitation and lack, and everything would be everyone's. There would be no me and mine. There would just be a sharing. And it would be out of that, because I can feel like even myself starting to go, oh, you know. <laughs> because we see the reality of the world and we think, oh, we have to protect, right? But if we were living in that kind of world where there were no possessions, we would trust one another. We would trust each other to share and take care of each other. We would trust each other to be in this kind of world, this unlimited source of God that is the, the true abundance, we would tap that and live from that and share from that. And there would never be a feeling of not enough or something's missing, which we often translate into I'm not enough or something's missing in me. But there would instead be a sense of I am all of it. <laughs> I am human and divine, worthy of the same respect as every living thing on earth. And it would be from that place that we shared. What a brilliant stroke of conceiving a divine idea, visioning and embodying it that John Lennon had when he wrote the song. There would be, if there were no possessions, no need for greed or hunger. So you don't have to remember to bring one of these like I did to you know, be reminded of your single eye although you might want to get one if you, you know, want a little physical reminder and just wear it around the house at night or something. <laughs> I envision a spiritually awakened world. I'm really working with that this week. It's, I'm dedicating myself and the power of imagination to work in my prayer time and meditation time to really envision this world. And I want to invite you into that vision. And if you wish to close your eyes, you may. You don't need to. In this world where everybody and everything is awakened spiritually, words like war and greed and domination, victim, disease, poverty, homelessness, murder, road rage, they don't exist anymore. They're in a dictionary for historical reflection of a lost civilization many, many years ago. No one is stressed out. No one is sleep deprived or over caffeinated. Everyone is fully grounded in their own inner power. And everyone follows their own inner guidance. There are no gurus anymore, no sages on the stage, only guides on the side. And you are one of them. Everyone has plenty. Everyone shares freely. There are no borders to defend. All are welcome to be wherever they want to go on this beautiful blue planet. It's one world. One humanity, one family. What we want and need is instantly manifested and nothing is wasted. All life honors and respects all life. We help each other achieve our universal needs for things like peace and love, community, appreciation, purpose, freedom. And we listen to the wisdom of our own bodies and the earth herself. We are good stewards of our human body and the body of earth, knowing they are one. We go within before we make decisions of any kind. Corporations and Political bodies, they always have allotted times of silence and prayer.
before making important decisions because they know that those decisions need to be made and seen from the single eye of spirit. In our families, in our corporations, our government officials, children and couples and animals and plant life, elementals and angels, we all work together for the greater good. We no longer have to designate our race or our gender or our ethnicity or our sexuality because we are each known to be of the same, same race, human, and the same origin, spirit, and animated by the same fuel, love. So you may say, I'm a dreamer, but I know you're one too. And I also know that together we can imagine this world as it truly is meant to be, one with God and each other, one in love. <laughs>